This is the DTV Digest, the podcast that brings you news and reviews of films which didn't make it to the cinema. And now, here's your host, Mike Parkin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DTV Digest. I'm your host, Mike Parkin, and joining me, as usual, is Richard Horse. Hello, everyone. This week, we have five main releases to talk about. We're going to kick off with Marco Zorro in Fist of the Condor. Then we have A Woman Under Siege in No One Will Save You. And then it's off for a bit of supernatural shindigs in The Haunting of Queen Mary. It's the end of school with end of term. And then a historic biopic, Washington Armour. Our short shot is Lollipop. And we're going to wind up with our DTV throwback, Ballistic. So without further ado, let's crack on. Our first film then is Fist of the Condor. A lone warrior is on a quest to find his twin brother after he had murdered his Sifu and stolen the secret training manual for the Fist of the Condor. So, Rich, um, Marco Zorro is still something of an unsung action hero, I think. Um, he's made quite a few films, you know, where he's had starring roles in films like Kiltro, um, uh, Mandrill, and oh, what's the third one called? There was one called Mirage Man, there's Mirage Redeemer. Man. That's right. Mirage was what I'm thinking of. Um, I've only seen Kill- Kiltro out of those, um, unfortunately. I haven't caught up with others. I think Kiltro is the only one. Is that a UK release? I think it is. <laughs> I think it might way. be right. Yeah, I think I think the other two have been released in the States. Um, but he's also very well known as a henchman. Um, he was the main bad guy in um, Undefeated 3 um, against Scott Atkins uh, with it with his Chocolaté. Um He's also very memorable in the recent um, John Wick 4 as the sort of very um, mendacious uh, henchman who eventually gets done in by the um, by the dog. Uh, but he, he's really, really good in that as well. So it's really great to sort of see him in a starring role here. In, in, in fact, in two starring roles here um, as, as our main character and the sort of enigmatic twin brother that we... Um, pop in to see every now and again um it's right it's probably no secret rich that i absolutely love this um it is the classic sort of martial arts formula uh lots of sort of training sequences lots of great fights and everything um and it's you know there, there is this sort of open-ended element we, we never get to the sort of the big duel between brother and brother which probably makes sense because they're the same person um but that doesn't mean we don't get a great fight at the end um with, with an absolute killer of a um a finishing move um i shall talk more about this in a minute but over to you rich yeah it's, it is um very much you know it's paying tribute to those like 1970s you know hong kong you know yep. martial arts shaw brothers all that sort of stuff um, you know, no cliche is left unturned. In a, in its own way, this is this is their version of Kill Bill, um, mm. right down to the um, chapter breaks and uh, yep. the you know the open ended. I mean, it even starts. It says um, it says it's like chapter part one or whatever at the mm. start in the um, in the opening title. You, you know from the start that that it's um, that it's a, a, the first volume or whatever it is you're going to consider it as. Um, although they're not putting that on the cover or, or the, you know, or the poster or the listing Indeed. or anything, but it, it yeah. does say on film that, that this is an incomplete project. Now, I've heard that it was originally a web series or it was conceived as a web series. Mm-hmm. And I, so I had that in mind when I was watching it and it really did help make sense of it because it's very episodic. Um, you know, it, it's literally, you could imagine that as like, here's a 10 minute short film. Here's the next 10 minute short film. You know, and you could watch them that way. You could even you could you could watch it that way quite easily. You could just finish one, have a pause or whatever, and you could you could digest it that way, or, or watch the whole thing in one go. It's um, how many chapters? How many? Or is it? They call it chapters, don't they? Yeah, it's, I yeah. think it's about there's like about what six or something. I think so. Six, so, six came to mind. Yeah, and every one of them sort of delves in a bit deeper. It's um, 
it, aesthetically it's all you know it's uh in terms of like i said leaning into the real martial arts cliches it's got you know fast paced you know um you know really intense um well choreographed action but it's also a very uh, and uh, fantastical action as well there's definitely say in the old style you know it's the um uh superhuman abilities kind of thing you know and this comes into play later when he's um when he's got to train to not use his legs and try and jump over these um you know vaults and stuff like that um and there's a you know there's a there's a master who's training them and you know it's, you know it's all this it's sort of a not pie may because it's a bit much nicer but um you know there's that master of apprentice kind of thing going on and um you know like and like we said there's the, the the twin brothers and there's the jealousy there's the book you know I was, we were talking about a uh, um wrath a completely different kind of film wrath of dracula and how all these moves were in this book this sacred book kind of thing and this that's what this film is about that's the that's the macguffin essentially of the film is they're trying to get this book which has um you know instruction the instructions of this uh, uh this uh uh, this deadly art, martial uh, art. yeah <laughs> deadly martial art the fist of the condor that is only known to a, a chosen few mm -hmm. uh and so they're, they're bad sort of that's that's the that's the motivating sort of factor and then there's revenge about the you know the death of a master and all that sort of stuff everything's everything's in there um it's uh but um but done fantastically well you know it, it's 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 showing you everything you've seen before uh i mean if the chilean angle um you know is is a is is a slight novelty but it doesn't it's not you don't really think about that it's very much of its own thing and also um you feel like it's a historic kind of piece because of all the very um, close landscapes and butts but every now and again they'll put you put you in an environment and say no this is happening now <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like it feels very historic but it's like no he's 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 gonna you know he's gonna walk into a bar and all this sort of stuff and so we get sort of contemporary kind of uh action scenes as well as the sort of more um, historic stuff and sort of the poetic sort of uh, um, um, musings and stuff that mm. the, the sort of the narration because uh, Marco Zorro himself as the characters he doesn't really have any dialogue he, he doesn't really talk he's um, he's you know he's very stoic um, a lot of the time he's actually on his own so he's not really inclined to you know to talk or anything so um we get this in a monologue now what i thought was quite interesting is there's this uh the, the there's the theme of duality that runs through the whole thing one of them being the twins thing but then there's also the um the, so that's the very literal side but then there's the duality of each individual character and also your you you sometimes get a bit un, uncertain about who actually is in the scene yeah uh, who you're following so are you watching that brother you know the good brother or you know good brother or bad brother and you know there's um there's little um uh slights of hand uh, mm -hmm. sort of thing is how i took it anyway no you're absolutely right rich um that there, there is that there's a very enigmatic quality towards the um you know the who who is we're actually with who, who are we actually sympathizing with mm. for you know a lot of this film because you know are, are we following the the chosen brother who was chosen by the Sifu to actually learn the fist of the condor and, and do all this hard training or is it his brother who is rejected but yet sort of hides in the background and secretly trains and then gets caught yeah. out and, and, and he's like, a line at one point they say oh and who are you really who training you, exactly and she's like, oh. yeah exactly <laughs> but, oh, there, there to ponder. <laughs> and, and even even you know that the um the, the, the let's call him the evil twins uh oh. henchman is like are you the same person you know even he's not yeah. entirely sure himself you know yeah. um what, what, what's going on um, but I think his deeds do speak for themselves. <laughs> There's certain <laughs> things that happen towards the end of the film, which yeah. kind of sort of point you in one direction at least. Or you know, but even then, it could be it could be Fight Club all over again. Mm. You know, it could be Tyler Durden and and the unknown guy. Um, but who knows? But um, even even so, I, I think you know this is it is one of the most poetic martial arts films I've seen. I think. Um, yeah. But completely yeah. accessible. It's it's oh, yeah. not like up its own what's it or whatever. It's, it's very no, not at all. Yeah, it's very um it it, it it walks that fine line 
Mm. You know, it knows to, when to, you know, deliver the sort of more thought provoking stuff and when to actually say, right, we're going to cut to the action now. Mm. So you get every, every, let's say every episode, you get a big set piece. Um, Absolutely. There's some great so you, in this. And you don't have to wait long between the two and you just sort of go along with it and you can sort of take, take, you know, take the ride and take as much out of it as you want. You could watch it for you can you can really absorb all that sort of spiritual side of it, or you can just watch it as a as a very straightforward kind of revenge tale. It's really however you want to um, take it, but you're going to enjoy it either way. I yeah. think oh, yeah. if you're a martial arts movie and, fan, and, and Marco Zorro himself, you know, I, I I don't think I've ever seen him look so well, you know, so powerful in a film. You know, um, it's it's just he's he comes across as just a pure martial artist in this, you know, um, and and the actual art they've they've made up for the film, you know, in, in the grand tradition of, you know, they're not um, sort of snake in the eagle shadow and this sort of stuff, you know, uh, where, where they sort of basing an art on, on the movements of an animal kind of mm, thing. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we, we, we got this great, you know, the, all these swooping arms and everything. I think I think it looks superb, you know, and the, and the, and the um, you know, the those punches that he does, are absolutely great. That that. Well, it's like in that bar, bar scene when he, you yeah. know, he does like the one inch punch kind of thing, and the guy yeah, just flies yeah. across the room. Yeah, I love all that. Um, brilliant. And, and as I said, that that end fight was superb, and the music. You've got to say, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, Marcos Raw. We, you know, people know we know of him, but you know, after his. Um, you know, we've we've sort of been familiar with like Kiltro when that came out and stuff like that, hmm. but and through the the Scott Atkins films, well, that's and, it. I mean, and, you know, I mean Kil- working with Robert Kiltro. Rodriguez, yeah, and John right. Wick, but he's still basically an unknown, and he's yeah. a, you know, and this is, you know, he's been around for well over fifteen years, yeah, and, and it's it, crazy it, that this is like one of what two films that had a UK release, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's interesting sort of to compare him now to what he was like in Kiltro as well, because in, mm. in Kiltro, his character is like this kind of this sort of lumbering oaf kind of thing who needs to be sort of, you know, he's like a lump of clay that needs to be sort of modelled. Here, here we've got the model, you know, which is even further refined as 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 the as the film goes on. But um, yeah, no, he's, he's he's superb in this. I thought, um, you know, as as and both. he's working with. Sorry, no, come. On. As is, sorry, you say. No, nope, carry on. Oh, sorry, um, I accidentally cut you off there. Um, the um, no, I was going to say the director Ernesto Diaz mm-hmm. Espinosa. He is the same director who um, Zorro has been working with since. Yeah. Um, Mirage Man and Kiltro and Mandrill. Uh, they also did Redeemer, which I think you see on uh, in a lot of. This, um, I haven't seen Redeemer, but you know, you look at the trailer and stuff, and you read about it, and you can see that that is the kind of thing that Zorro is really interested in, sort of the spiritual hmm. side as well as the sort of hard-hitting action. And that's what you get. That's what we've de- they've developed with this. Um, earlier films, like, say, Mandrill was like a James Bondish sort of fun yeah. kind of adventure. That I, and I think Mirage Man was a superhero movie. So they've toyed in different genres. Um, hmm. But I think Zorro is, is quite a... He seems... Qu- you know, he seems like quite a guy who, who you know, he's very focused. I, he, I, I'm... I feel like he's like his character in this, yeah, that, he's, yeah. that he's someone who's got a lot, you know, he's very stern, you know, very focused, but, you know, he's got, he's got a lot going on. He's, he's, you know, he's, he, he's a very conservative kind of guy. Um, and we often don't get to see much of that, but we, we, we get to see a bit more of it now through, like to say, it's expressed through the, um, through his uh, narration, you know, through the way he's articulating himself. And again, that's another sort of a duality kind of thing because he's like keeping all of that hidden, but he's sharing that with, you know, yeah, who's exactly. he talking to? He's talking to the audience. He's sharing it. It's like his inner monologue and he's sharing it with the audience. Mm-hmm. Whereas it, it's, it's I, otherwise he's not talking. He's probably, um, I think as he's got like a family and he's, you know, he doesn't really, probably doesn't really share that side of himself with them. And, uh, yeah, there's um, or is that the brother? I get confused. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> Which yeah. one's it? So, um, yeah, I, I did like it a lot. I wasn't sure because it's one of those films that comes with a lot of uh, hype, you know, yeah. expectation. So I was a little hesitant to actually watch it because I was worried I wasn't going to enjoy it as much as you know the uh, the internet was telling me I yeah. was going to. But yeah, I mean, we got some really good. I just want to mention uh, uh, some of the supporting players. In the mm-hmm. film, so we got um, Jose Manuel, 
who's a um, uh, great. Uh, I think he's Portuguese. Mm -hmm. We've seen we've seen him in uh, a few. Well, we we've definitely watched him in, in the short film uh, by Bob Bobby Samuels, which was uh, Yogando do. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up the title. Uh, Con Fuego. Uh, oh which yeah, was yeah. The uh, one where um, the American mm -hmm. uh, like uh, agent goes to uh, it's like a forty minute film. We we covered it a few weeks ago. Um, you, you can find it on YouTube, and he has a great like knife fight with uh, I think it's him and um, uh, like a uh, another character. So it's like there's two on one kind of thing. Really really good fight scene. But he also did a film called uh, The Man from Kathmandu, where yeah. He's actually the lead in that. It's a Nepalese film. He's cast as Nepalese or half Nepalese, but uh, he, and uh, that's that's a, a, another film that's not really available. It's not available in the UK, um, but he and that was from a couple of years ago. But the, I think that's his only leading feature role. But there's some fantastic stuff in that. I mean, he's a very Jackie Chan influenced kind of guy, so definitely well worth checking out so him, some of his stuff. But the other people in this um, that he fights, like like the. Uh, henchman as it were who, who has the the climactic showdown with um i wasn't familiar with him or um or or really many of the others so um it's a, it's another it's great to always sort of discover new people as well as sort of seeing someone you you know familiar with like say marco zero and seeing him and i was in one well fight fight is great but the other fights were really good you know there wasn't a there wasn't a poor <laughs> fight scene in the whole film no, you know so it's like they're, they're, it's you know good. you get your money's worth definitely uh, speaking of cast members, uh, Gina Aguad, who plays um, the Sifu, Muha mm -hmm. Condor, is actually Marco Zavor's mum. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> she was great, though. She was, she really was very good. good in that, yeah. Very good. Okay, um, scores on the doors, Rich. Uh, I'm going to say a... It's got to be an eight, hasn't it? I think. It does. I was going to give it a nine, but I am going to have to dock it a point just for the um, the title cards. I, I will give it credit, though, because at least people actually say the words. <laughs> you know, so whatever the, the title's called actually comes up in the dialogue for that thing. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so make a drinking game out of it or something. Well, that's but, what I was saying. We kind of got to let that slide, because I think, say, I think it's because of the... I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I, it's I because it was a web series, which backs up the sort of budgetary kind of look of it. It does look and feel more like it was a you know a lower budget but still slick looking but sort oh, of a lower budget slick. yeah i mean yeah, I, I love all the all the stuff filmed on the coast and everything you yeah know, the, the, exactly the, the, yeah. it's all great the music as well you know it's a mix of um you know different genres but there's a very heavy sort of like um south american folk influence to it uh, which mm -hmm. which i really got into i must admit so yeah it's a very high eight for me so it's two Ooh. eights for fist of the condor so i'll just ask one, one other thing because um I, the other sort of uh, films that came to mind of the similar sort of era was like kung and kung fu you know david carradine cut stuff mm -hmm. but the um the silent flute came to mind as i was Indeed. watching it yeah yeah do you think that's because i haven't seen the silent flute for a long time and i was oh, couldn't remember what yeah does that is is that again in the right. same yeah. kind of wheelhouse? I think you're of. right because there is, because it is that sort of quest, you know, um, to you know to to get back to sort of fighting David Carradine's character, isn't yeah. it? I think you know he's he, he, yeah. So so there is definitely that element. There is a sort of spiritual element to it, and it all goes back to Bruce Lee, obviously. So Indeed. this is this is I think so. he doesn't. I don't don't know if there's any any name checks or because a lot of these kind of films they'll. They'll do. They'll add a name check somewhere, but I can't remember if there's actually. I haven't noticed a name, this time around. A name yeah. check for Bruce Lee, but the I think Bruce Lee's influence mm. is tangible over the whole film. I mean, as he as as he is over the entire martial arts film genre. Yeah, totally agree. Anyway, there we have it. Two eights for Fist of the Condor. Go check it out. Our next film is No One Will Save You. Bryn Adams lives a solitary existence in her house in the middle of a forest. One night she discovers to her horror that someone or something has broken in and is roaming around downstairs. So this is a film which has recently hit Hulu in the States and Disney in the UK. Um, comes with 
a lot of excitable word of mouth, Rich, mm -hmm. uh, which has sort of like pushed us towards checking it out. Yes. Um, I did like this, uh, not probably as much as some people do, from you know judging by the way people have reacted to it. Um, it does have a few novel ideas in that. You know, there, there is very little dialogue in the film. I think there's only about two, maybe three lines, which are sort of, you know, rushed through. Um, but the rest of it is just noise um, and uh, ambient sort of sound effects and things. Um, it plays, it, it doesn't play its cards that close to its chest. It is very open about what's going on very quickly. Um, you know, as soon as it turns to nighttime, we, we're, we're very aware what is going on kind of um you know it, it, it's not coy about who the threat is or anything it's like right there in your face um and it sort of develops from there it, it also um it handles exposition very well i don't know about you but i was exp because of the backstory to do with Bryn and her friend maud mm. and that relationship there um I was really expecting, I, I literally expecting, right, any second now, uh, especially as the film went on, there's going to be a newspaper clipping or something, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to flutter in front of the camera and we're going to know finally what happened way back when, you know. But it, it handles it in a different way, which was, which was kind of cool and quite nasty as well, actually, when you mm -hmm. find out what actually happened. Um, but there you go. Um, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, the um, I, it's funny you say about the exposition because I was I kind of think about that. It's almost a film without exposition, and it mm. doesn't take any of those cheap tricks of you know uh, a montage of uh, newspaper clippings. As, as no, you were saying, yeah, there's no which, news reports telling us no what's news going reports on, or anything. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing like that. I think the see, I knew going. I'm going to preface this saying this is a film it's best to know very as little about as possible before you yeah. go in. So. I would say skip over if you don't if you if you're planning on seeing it, you just want to go in completely blind. Um, we're not going to go into like proper spoilers, but yeah. anything you know and, and skip skip we'll say, IMDb. Could, <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to try to avoid any uh, chatter about it. That's the problem with some of these things. You got to avoid mm. you know being on social media and everything. But but so I knew I I, initially, I already knew that there wasn't going to be really any dialogue. So that sort of sort of piqued my interest. Um, because I'd, I'd seen it come come up, and I was I was a bit unsure about it, but I thought, okay, that sounds interesting. Hmm. Um, it's been done before; we've seen it a couple of times. I, I remember there was, was a... yeah, well, there's a quiet place and things like that as well. But I mean, it, the the reasons are different. You yes. know, it, it, it's it's not because they have to be quiet, otherwise the aliens no. are going to get them. You know, but it's um, well, the, the... that's the thing. It is a yeah. conceit, yeah. essentially, yeah. because. Although it is a one person alone kind of thing, I don't know how much dialogue there was in stuff like The Shallows, for example, of you know, of the character maybe shouting at sharks or whatever it is. But this is a character who's very internal, doesn't you know, doesn't you know, a movie would normally maybe have the character walking around the house talking to themselves or oh, they've got yeah, a dog yeah. and they'll talk to the dog or they'll talk talk to the mirror or whatever they'll do. And she doesn't, she doesn't say a word. Uh and you know, and they don't have a they don't make an excuse for it, like she's a mute or something like that. Mm. Um, the uh, so I'm, I'm quite interested to see what they do with um, you know with this John Woo uh, film, Silent, yeah, Silent, Silent, like how they handle that because that's going to that's going to be a very different kind of thing. How are you not going to have any dialogue in a situation like that? Mm. Um, so this one is you know she's living on her own, it's isolated. So for the most part, she doesn't have any reason to talk to anyone. In a normal kind of situation, they'd be shouting at the you know the threat or whatever mm. you know. But um, here they don't they don't lean on that they are just very much focused and you don't think about it after a while it becomes very natural it, yeah. um, it, it sort of eases now when she goes into uh, you know an environment where there's more people I think it's harder to sell that because yeah. they, they it becomes then very obvious that they're trying not to have dialogue when really there would be I mean there's some muffled kind of say they muffle sort of sound in the background but then you get a couple of encounters where it it just feels like there would be something said, yeah. and that they, they, they're sort of the mo the movie is biting biting its lip to try not to, um, because they want to hold out for um, you know to have more impact when 
particular words are spoken and stuff. So, but I think for the most part, um, it, it works really well. Uh, and you, you are very dr driven and drawn by the, you know, the visual and say auditory, you know, is it, there's no dialogue, but it's not, you know, it's one of those things where you say a silent film, but it's not a silent film. You know, in the old days, silent films still had a score. Nowadays, you, you, you wouldn't call this a silent film because the sound design is too complex. So it's just a film with, with minimal dialogue, I would say, but there's everything else going on. Fantastic Absolutely. score and all this sort of stuff. It's very, the first thing that struck me is it, it just looks amazing. The, the, the cinematography is really striking. You know, every mm. shot is composed beautifully. Uh, I, I, um, I will say, that, uh, oh, an excellent tension. It, I didn't know going in that it was going to be such a horror film, which it is for the most part. I think it's, it's very much, you know, it, it leans into the horror genre probably more than any. But I will say that the, sort of the, uh, the Steven Spielberg influences are very apparent um, yeah. as well as other things. I mean, another before I saw, I saw it, another comparison that people have made was Signs, which mm -hmm. I think is very warranted. Um, so the, the, they, specifically, they were referring to like the final act of Signs. So there are Signs similarities, but the sort of Spielberg in even that film was like a Spielberg influence. So the, the Spielberg influence is sort of through that, you know, there's, so there's films like um, Close Encounters and War of the Worlds are in there. Um, but also the, the Spielberg influence stuff like um, Super 8, I think Super 8 would fit really yep. nicely with this. They they all do similar things, which was another film, which really lent into horror quite a lot, but then also had this quite heartfelt stuff going on as well, which is also a part of this film which is, again, is a Spielberg kind of thing to do. The, um, uh, this is made, written and directed by Brian Duffield, by the way, who, made, who is a, a writer, foremost a screenwriter, did films like Love and Monsters, I'm um, a big fan Underwater, of, yeah. the two babysitter movies, which, yeah. uh, which we saw the first one liked. Uh, and he did um, uh, his previous film that he directed was one I've been quite interested to see. It's called Spontaneous. It's, it's, it's like a love story mm -hmm. about people spontaneously combusting or something was... Uh, a strange sort of comedy romance kind of horror kind of thing um but uh, yeah and love and monsters was supposed to be really good as well um and he also worked on or developed the skull island uh, animated i think it's an animated series on netflix um so the uh our lead actress uh should uh, should mention her because she carries the film you know um caitlin uh dever um as Bryn, very interesting engaging character great performance you know she's got a lot to do you know say the film is on her shoulders i think in the second half of the movie i lost it a bit i lost my enthusiasm a bit it does go very very cgi mm -hmm. um perhaps a bit too much for my liking and it becomes a bit more complex let's say uh, as as the conclusion draws uh, and so i think i really enjoyed the sort of first half of the movie the most Mm -hmm. um same without sort of giving anything or anything away it's all i'd say the first half is the more sort of pure horror and tension kind of part then we get into more of a blockbuster kind of um sort of bang crash kind of section and then the third and then the the, the final part is sort of um yeah um goes in sort of different directions that i won't very uh, enigmatic but, ending i think very yeah there's uh, there's different things to sort of unpack about it and it's uh um it's presented in a very, very uh, unique way. It's basically, you're not going to see it coming. <laughs> it's, it's like the way this film ends. You're just not. It's it's you're not going to see it coming. I'll, I'll just say that much. But, um, yeah. So how how were you? What what were your thoughts on the film? How did you? How did I you thought it was, it was okay. You know, I, I did enjoy it. Um, I was kind of surprised at the level of budget it had. You know, a lot of these films. It's all about the lighting, you know, all the spooky lights outside, that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. keeping things as, um, you know, as coy as possible as to what's really going on. Or, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep the the threat out of sight, you know, as much as possible. This one is like, nah, there you go, mate. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and if you like that one, there's more coming. You know, <laughs> there's all different shapes and sizes of things sort of coming at you. Um, I will say the threat is very um, classic. Mm -hmm. You know, they've not gone for anything. They, they, they've gone for a real particular, I think there's a touchstone of like the 1950s or something in this because they're, they, you know, the yeah. look, the, the, you know, the threat and the, the things, you know, around. It's a very, um, it's a very on, on the nose kind of classic, yeah, yeah presentation yeah. 
of that particular yeah. you know it, everything's in there <laughs> it's like yeah. um, without going into it too much but all the familiar I, tropes yeah. you will recognize you're like oh yeah it's that bit that um... i i was wondering though um when, when she sort of like there's an incident early on with, with um, a clock tower, shall we say. Mm. And I, I was wondering whether or not it was all some sort of psychotic break on her part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that she was she was interpreting things as being what it is. But in fact, she's just like killed a bunch of people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> but that was, that was just me. <laughs> I think they could have gone there, and I think even yeah. towards the end that, that that could be that could you know it because there was that know, look I, of surprise, you know. There's hmm. like, oh, what, why, why have you done this sort of thing? You know, um, a couple of times because you know she, it's not just one. It, 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 I think she kills about you know quite a few in the end. But, um, I can just sort of imagine them sort of going, you know, especially because we, you know, we can't understand what's being said. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if, 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 if they're eventually going to be able to interpret what was actually being said and it's going to turn out to be, oh, you know, <laughs> you just killed Jerry or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, well, that's, a, a, it's interesting. I think you could potentially even read the whole, you could potentially read it that way. I think, mm. um, argue, you know, there's different ways you can go at it. But the, you know, we were talking in the previous film about duality, mm. and that's present in here as well. There's a really interesting thing they do, where uh, you're following your main, the main character Bryn, mm -hmm. and you know, it's the classic thing of there's something behind her. You know, mm. it's blurred away and it's in the distance, but you can you can just about see something. And they they play that typically, you know, that kind of typical mm. scene. But then they flip it; they do it the other way. Yeah, we follow, like, we, right follow <laughs> we follow the threat yeah. and then she becomes the thing in the background <laughs> which i thought was really interesting and then there's other things with duality where she sort of encounters another version of herself um mm. uh, you know she, there's some dream stuff and different things happening um so yeah there's 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 something about um conf you know she's trying to confront herself Mm -hmm. um you know because as I say she's carrying a lot of baggage it's a film about try her trying you know her journey to overcome trauma which is sort of the, that's the kind of the heart of the film of mm -hmm. you know the journey that she's supposed to be taking over the course of the film not just battling the the threat and being a very resilient heroine but actually you know um overcoming her own sort of baggage you know that's like uh, you know we don't un we don't like you say there's no real um it takes a long time for the, you know, for, for things to become clear as to why she is, you know, living such an isolated life and, um, and why people react to her in a certain way when she's, um, you know, when she com comes into company and yeah. stuff. So um, uh, I think for the most part, I, I, I think, it w I think it does work. I think, it, you know, some people will be very thrown as I was a bit thrown by the final act. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do, I do think it's. I definitely think it's worth seeing. It's really worth. It is really worth seeing. It's probably one of those films that's going to reward a rewatch, you know. And then you can sort of delve into things a bit more rather than. Um, but I think some some people would just go, "Wow," you know. It's like, mm. I'm completely taken with it straight away. And other people will be going like, "Okay, um, yep." Okay, <laughs> I, 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 I was with you. I was with you for most of it, and I was, I'm, I'm just. I'm just a bit. Uh, can I just can I just put my hand up and ask a, a question, yeah. kind of thing? But uh, yeah, so I mean, it was really a, a pleasant surprise. I've never heard of it. I didn't didn't know anything about it. Mm. It popped up. I saw people talking about it. I gave it a shot. It, 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 you know, the fact that all the buzz was attached to it, I thought it lived up to the buzz, and you know, it had enough surprises that that you know made it a novel experience. But it, um, yeah, I think it, how um, is there anything? I don't think I've, I've no. got anything more to say on it. Have you? I, I like yeah, the bit on the bus as well. The, the bus sequence was really good. Yeah, that was really cool. That's, yeah, that's, they, they, that's they do the. That was another one of those sort of, um, you know, War of the Worlds. I would say War of the Worlds kind of. It was um, interesting as well because it's one of those elements where you've got a a protagonist who's thinking rationally, mm -hmm. 
It's like this this freaky shit going on in my house. I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> you know, I'm just ditching this place and leaving town. <laughs> um, you know, obviously that would be a short film if that <laughs> if if she was able to do that. But um, what's well, another film that actually um I want to mention as a sort of a film that that you could watch this with, hmm. which follow, works with some similar themes, which is Nope, which I right. didn't really get on with. I didn't think it was. Hmm. I didn't. I wasn't quite with it. But so it does touch it. on some similar. Have you seen it yet? No, not yet. It's very different to this. Yeah. Um, but it's but there are certain elements, and in that case, you know, it's kind of the whole thing about nope is just like you know you see, <laughs> you, you you're in this kind of situation. You know, ah, ah, no, no, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going <laughs> kind of thing. But um, you know, and in that case, they they can't actually extract themselves from the situation. Yeah. But the um, but the there that's very that's characters in a very isolated setting dealing with this thing and it's got you know it's sci-fi it's horror there's a bit of comical stuff in there this hasn't really got this hasn't really got any comedy it's got some fantastical stuff in it hmm. but um yeah i think uh, the um yeah i think people who enjoyed nope would would probably find this quite quite involving quite interesting i think mm-hmm. um there's another franchise that this very much is based on but again i don't want to mention it because <laughs> the uh, not franchise did. The, yeah. sorry we already did. Did we? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, I, t- I totally agree. Um, how are you going to score it? Uh, I think I'm going to give it an eight, actually. Yeah. For, 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 although I've got some reservations about some of it, I think so, so much of it works really well that I have to give it an eight. I'm giving it a seven. So there you go. That is an eight and a seven for No One Will Save You. Uh, it's available on Hulu in the States and it's on Disney Plus here in the UK. Go check it out. Our next film is The Haunting of the Queen Mary. This explores the mysterious and violent events surrounding one family's voyage on Halloween night in 1938 and their interwoven destiny with another family on board the famous ocean liner in present day. I think this is a case, Rich, where they had access to a brilliant location, um, but didn't really know what to do with it. So just threw everything they had written down at it. It's... Oh, I I don't know. The pacing, the atmosphere is dull. There are, there are yeah. Sorry, um, there are moments where things happen. There, there's some good gory moments, admittedly. There's a whole really mean spirited bit to do with the sun, uh, which I honestly thought like, well, wow, they've um, they've done that, you know, before. It turns out they haven't. Um, but that that was interesting. But overall, I just found it just a bit dull overall. How about you? I was blown away by it. I was, I was, I thought it was one of the most visually striking uh, <laughs> films I've seen in ages. I wasn't, I wasn't sure what it was. I thought it was going to be like Titanic two going in. Right. I was expecting something really low budget, uh, and this is lavish. Um, the um, it's got. Um, I, I was also put off by the because I was thinking, oh, it's two. It's two plus hours. It's two hours five minutes long. I was like, that's mm-hmm. that's really long. You know, that's really unusual for a film. Um, you know, for a DTV film to be that long. Uh, this is this is a film that I think really deserves to be seen in the cinema because it just looks fantastic. Um, it's a bit like what we were saying about a couple of um, about like the previous film. Mm. It's like fantastically composed shots. Um, it. it it, and some nice visual effects as well. The um, although derivative, you know, it's kind of stuff we've seen before, a bit like whether it's Titanic or um, uh, Poseidon kind of thing. But you know, it's sweep, sweeping shots, and you know, we see the ship, and it doesn't look rubbish. You know, the exteriors no, of the ship when they yeah. show it, it looks really good. The um, parallel narratives cut in between the uh, between 1938 and the present, or is it? You know, is, is it actually happen? Is it actually something that happened in 1938 but it's actually happening now it's like in in the sort of spirit world as it were kind of thing you know we're not quite sure it's it's all you know open to interpretation what's happening because there's very fantastical stuff happening in that particular version 
or, or the story. So whether that's a uh, an ongoing nightmare thing. So, you know what it reminded me? Of? I, I haven't seen Triangle, but the one it re- but it really reminded me of there was an X Files episode where Mulder and Scully uh, were. I think they were on a ship in the Bermuda Triangle, and it, that was a sort of time travel All sort right. of thing. And um, so I was kind of reminded of that. And so I think the film Triangle, the Christmas Smith film. Mm-hmm. I was set on a boat. I think it might it have was. done. A... Yep. Was it a it ship? Was, was it, it a ship? Was, yeah, it was like, yeah, like yeah. a cruise liner sort of thing. Yeah. Cruise liner kind of thing. Um, but I think the film that this most is channeling, a bit like, let's say, the previous film was channeling a bit of, you know, quite a, uh, a heavy Steven Spielberg influence. I think The Shining, Shining. is kind of all over this. Yeah. Uh, it, there's a lot of like scenes that are. Or, or even, even down to the snazzy carpets. Yeah, well, that was the thing. I was going to say, like, the hallways and, you know, the chi- the thing with children, um, you know, the little boy going around, which is really um, unexpected casting because mm-hmm. he, he's, he's um, um, uh, what's the, his, the boy's name's Lenny. Uh, he's, he's actually from Essex. Uh, and he was, he played Tiny Tim in uh, a recent version of um, Christmas Carol. Uh, and he's he's got I believe he's got the same con- condition as Warwick Davis, so he's he looks very young. He's very small, yeah. But he's but he's about eight years old, and um, so he uh, that sort of plays into the the story with the uh, with his mother, who's played by Alice Eve, and she, so she's she's very concerned about his health and stuff, but. Really, she's not. You think she's kind of says she is. Oh, stuff, there's, but... there's a whole bit, a whole bit of the beginning, hmm. where you know there's stuff happening to him, and yeah. she's just like blithely, totally unaware of it. You know, yeah, like, they're complete. What, 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 both, what? both of them are. Yeah. You know, the, the, both of them are, seem to be completely oblivious, and that's really odd in certain points. Um, hmm. Like, for example, something happens to him. Uh, you don't know what's happened, and then all of a sudden you see him again, and he's all like wet and stuff. But they're barely paying any attention to it. I know. And um, there's something, but. Whether that's them or the ship's influence, because this is the thing that's the, the sort of the the evil of the ship or whatever it is, um, which eventually comes out. There's some stuff. Um, it's um, it gets into the characters, mm. and so it starts affecting the way they behave, and you know they forget, which um, is what happened. It happens quite suddenly, actually, in the, with the with the, with the flashback story. I'll say with yeah. the 1938 events. It's like things are going one way, and then all of a sudden, it's yeah. like. But I do agree with what you were saying about you know they kind of throw lots at it because there's there's lots of different stuff happening, and it's all going all over the place. So we got the parallel narrative, we've got the parents in the past, parents in the present, we've got some side characters that we're following, hmm. we've got um, the uh, the stuff going on in the boiler room, um, and I think it it is, a, and that's where the two hours comes from because there's just so much they're trying to pack yeah. in. Uh, and no, it doesn't all work necessarily. But I think uh, I think a bit like with um, No One Will Save You, I think enough of it worked for me. Mm. I mean, I was just completely transfixed by it for the most part. I actually prefer it to um, No One Will Save You, probably because it ha- does have that kind of consistency. It doesn't have any sort of um, more... Uh, yeah, it kind of stays its course, as, as it were. You know, you, got, you kind of know where you're saying. But you do get a bit lost with kind of like, I think it tries to be. It try it might maybe maybe it's trying to be a bit too clever and it, and it just loses the audience a bit because you're like, well, I, I I'll be honest, I don't know what you're doing here, <laughs> <laughs> what what's happening with this bit, yeah. um, but I can the general sense of it is, uh, it's like the here's Johnny kind of thing. It's it's you know the yeah, I mean there's even a, there's a bar scene where that that so it might that makes you think of um, the Shining and stuff, and I think it's all these characters, these particular characters. Um, the sort of the sanity, you know, they they start to lose their sanity, and that's what we see in the past with the, with, with the, the parallels. There's the kit, there's the captain of the past, mm-hmm. and then there's this guy who calls himself captain, but he's essentially supposed to refer to as basically a security, security guard. guard yeah. <laughs> and because the ship is, um, you know, static, it's a tourist attraction, it's Queen Mary, and it's in yeah, the United it's in, States. That is in, where uh, they film. Los Angeles, um, isn't it? Yeah, I think actually, um, I'm not it's sure how much they filmed it there. Because I think they filmed it in various places, and I saw HMS Belfast, which is oh, um, in London. Yeah, I saw that on the um, on the end credits. So I'm wondering if that's where they shot some of the boiler room scenes and stuff, because yeah, that's got a very, you know, big accessible kind of 
So he, would, he, he wouldn't be shooting the ballroom scene there, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But you got the, I mean, production value here in terms oh, of the cinematography, yeah. the production design. It's fantastic. I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I, I'm really surprised to, to see a film of this standard. Hmm you know, not getting a, a cinema release. I mean, you do, it does happen. Obviously, we see it all the time. Um, but I would have thought, of, I would have thought, I, I would have been more un, unsurprised if I saw this as a Netflix original, you know, mm. or, or an Amazon, because that's kind of what I expect. But when you get something like this just going VOD, so it's not really got any sort of natural, um, you know, um, marketing kind of push, you know, yeah. it does. it's not going to appear on anyone's, Log, you know, no one's going to log in and see it and then start watching it or whatever. Um, you know, even without any big marketing, that still that still puts it in front of people's faces or whatever. This is still a film that people is going to struggle, I think, because hmm. the the title and the cover, the cover and the title and everything is is actually really generic, and does, which is why I wasn't that. I mean, I was curious, um, but I was, you know, it, it doesn't tell me anything. It's also, it it seems like kind of, I, I you know. Okay, fair enough. There's loads of films called The Haunting. There was another film called The Haunting of that came out yeah. this week. You know, it's so familiar. I mean, we've got, uh, and there was the, um, what was it, the Mike Flanagan series. I think that was a, there was The Haunting yeah. there. The Haunting of Bly Manor, The Haunting yeah, of Hill House. So we've seen, yeah. we've seen it so much. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's what they're trying to do with do here, you know, do that. But I think that's to the detriment of the film. I think it, it was um, so to that sense so maybe that is what's what's gone wrong here i think it's a really well made film mm -hmm. uh that that um you know okay it's not perfect it's got some flaws or whatever but i i was you know really drawn into it for I was, you know, the compositions were fantastic i was on board at the beginning i think it opens brilliantly you know it's in the midst of a crisis Mm. when the film starts and we've got that great sort of like shot going in through the porthole into the, you know from the exterior interior yes, yes and you know we're following various crew members as they're mm -hmm. trying to sort of muster the passengers because something's going on you know um, in the ship itself i think all that was great and i wish it had just continued from that point onwards but no you know then we get oh a few hours earlier that evening i thought oh you know, now we have to build up to it again, sort of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hate in well, it's a, it's, a, it's got it's say it's got these parallel narratives. It's got flashbacks within those kind of. It's got like flashbacks within flashbacks, kind of kind of thing going on, and and side things and fantastical scenes and whatever. So that it it you could it's like like you say it's throwing everything at it, isn't it? It's trying every single trick in the book. Yeah. I found some of the pacing to be off, um, which is why I sort of said I found it a bit dull overall. There, there was one element I did like with the um, the modern captain um, receiving phone calls, telling him, you know, it, it's almost like there's a conspiracy around the, the you mm -hmm. know, the, 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 the ship. And it's like, yeah, we, we know there's weird shit happening here, but we're trying to keep a lid on it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that, that, that was uh, interesting, I must admit. Um, and as I said, you know there are some very gory moments along the way, and and yeah, and the bit with the boy in the in the swimming pool and stuff yeah. that was really intense. It was, yeah. That's what, that's what I mean. I thought, oh, my, oh, they're re really going to go there, you know. Um, I thought, I thought that was it. He's done. <laughs> well, that's one of the confusing things because they never kind of clarify it. You're not actually sure what happened. What you know, mm. you know is. Is he or isn't he? You know, kind of thing. It's like one of those things. So it's like, um, yeah, because uh, there's well, other stuff that happens yeah, to the character later. Because, well, there's, there's the daughter and the other, you know, in the, in the past as well. Yeah, happens, which is all to do with uh, the parallel that's going yeah, on. It's like indeed. you've got you know, mother, you've got a family of three and a family of three and a captain of the captain, and there's, they're trying to do do the you know this, these parallel stories, and then let's add in the captains as well. Let's yeah. let's have them sort of going a little bit mad and and stuff and uh yeah I, I think if you do see i like the captain stuff i don't think it's necessary hmm. i don't i think the film could have easily done without it or at least toned it down and just sort of hinted at it rather than developing those bits yeah. but um i think it, you know it adds to the color and, and texture of it but i think you know if you'd have trimmed that out you'd have had a more solid fam you know focused on the family 
sort of dynamic kind of maybe it's more of a swift hour and a half kind of film but i'm not sure necessarily i really want that i'm i'm i quite i quite like it's um mm-hmm. uh you know cop, you know mis not misguided but it, you know it, it it's ambition let's say <laughs> whatever i say i i quite like that i mean the, they've made this over two hours and they've tried to put so much into it uh and i'm just pretty i've i was i was perplexed by a fair amount of it but um I thought a lot, of, you know, there's there's a bit with like axe murder kind of stuff again, mm-hmm. it's The Shining, <laughs> but the axe murder stuff kind of was really intense, really worked really well. Um, the uh, there's some interesting stuff with the the daughter in the past, and she's interacting with, you know, people like Fred Astaire and stuff, which is really um, unusual. Which is again the sort of is it is that did did that actually happen, or is this sort of a fantastical memory, or you know, mm-hmm. a, a sort of a uh, a dreamlike version of like um you know that they're living through maybe you know the the ghosts I mean, is that the ghosts you know experiencing this, it, this that is not the actual series of events but that is like a replayed sort of mm. uh scenario that that they're, they're, there's a sort of a cycle that they're stuck in who knows okay. i don't know I, don't, I didn't quite catch what what they were getting at with some of that stuff but i like i quite like that it was all in there really mm. and, and so i thought the cast did a good job alice eve is um you know, really good as always. Um, I think she gets a bit short shrift for it, really, with some of the stuff because she she does a lot of really good work, and then it gets these like you know low key releases and stuff, and so mm. a lot of her stuff just doesn't really get seen. I mean, you know, you can't. She, I might be wrong, but I can't think of the last time one of her films had a had a big outing apart from when she was in uh, you know like um, Star Trek Into Darkness. Hmm. And stuff like that. But I think she's really good. Indeed. Okay. How are you going to score it? I'm going to give it another eight because I, I really, really enjoyed it. I think the say, cinematography and the music and stuff um, worked, worked really well. So I think there's, there's enough here that I would, I would potentially go back and watch it again. So I'm going to say eight. Okay. I'm going to give this one another seven. Okay. So that's a seven and an eight for The Haunting of the Queen Mary. Go check it out. Our next film is End of Term. A group of students are tormented by the lingering menace of Garth Stroman, an artist who had a disturbing vision 50 years prior. The pupils discover that true art can only be achieved through suffering and pain. Um, Interesting framework for this one rich in that Mm. um it is set up as a police procedural where the one one of the survivors of something that's happened at the school or or the what you know student accommodation um and she's being interviewed as to what had happened sort of the nights before i quite like that setup i think we've seen it before but it's a setup i do i do like um however it's it's it doesn't stick to it you know um the it, the film portrays events of things which she could not have been party to or aware of um which is which is kind of where it breaks down for me a bit there there is one incredibly stupid moment which 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 made me just like slap my forehead in disgust and and despair um there's a character in the film who's like a an art critic and a a much reviled art critic who's at this um this gallery opening and he's you know he's he's telling everyone what pieces of shit they are or that and he goes off to the loo and he's singing or he's whistling a tune by mozart and as he comes out he hears someone in the distance singing the same tune and decides to go and investigate why? <laughs> what? Why? Why? Why would he? You know? Oh, somebody's whistling. I'd better go and find out what they're. No, go back to the party <laughs> where where there's food and drink and people. Instead of wandering these, I just couldn't. You know, it it just seemed an incredibly contrived moment. Um, and you know there were others peppered throughout the film. I, I didn't get on with this one particularly well. I, I, I may, maybe it's a case of fatigue 
for this kind of film. We had that South African one recently. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, it's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple of kills which are interesting. It's a whole thing. It was Rage, one. wasn't it? it was rage. Yes, that's it, Rage. Yeah. Um, in this one, one, one of the art students has built this death trap in order to sort of capture the, you know, the fear in somebody's eyes when they're in the machine. And of course, something goes wrong later on. Of course it does. Um, I don't know. How did you get on with this one? I will say also, uh, it, it was great to see Peter Davison. He, he's having something of a sort of late career resurgence because he, he turned up in something else recently as well. Um I can't remember what it is now, off the top of my head. But it is great to sort of see, um, you know, the Fifth Doctor um, back on our screens. Uh, still, think... still, still very youthful as well. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, still very recognisable <laughs> yeah. as you know, yeah. as Peter Davison, as it were, um, yeah. which is great. You know, so so I was, I was great to see him uh, in this. But uh, yeah, how how did you get on with this one, Rich? I liked it more than I was exp- with, than I thought I would really. I thought it was a very very. It's a slasher movie, basically. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, it's a but a very you know a very good you know take on it. You know, it's like it, it didn't feel. I think it was felt about right. It's not got a big budget, but it's mm. uh, it it was it had just enough money, and you know just made just you know a good enough standard that it's that it's made that it stood out. And, you know, the quality was you know on the on the higher side. It didn't feel like a, um, you know, it's got quite this kind of contrived sort of setup with the with the art school and everything, mm. but I thought it worked okay. You know, the obnoxious kids, sort of, you know, young people sort of thing. I mean, we've we've we watched a short film recently, which was um, uh, about you know an art school, uh, a girl at art school and sort of, sort of losing her mind and, and oh, stuff, yeah. stuff stuff happening. Uh, and there's a little bit of that in here, um, that same sort of idea. But essentially, it's yeah, it's like the the slasher movie thing, but with that you know, uh, interrogation room sort of um, framework kind of thing. Um, a bit like uh, like all the other films we've talked about today. Funnily enough, this is a film that has like some quite very some very well known films as very key touchstones, uh, especially as you get towards the end. I'm like, no, this this literally is that movie. <laughs> It's like, uh, by the time you get to the end, you're like, it's like the, you, you've, you've copied it like right down to the thing. It's like, um, which I think was a bit of a mistake. I mean, it's yeah. fine, but I think I think that that made the ending a bit more, um, oh come on, kind of thing than it than it than it could have been. Uh, the, uh, you know, it sort of undermined the film a bit. I think you know, do all the slasher movie sort of cliches as you like. You know, it, that doesn't bother me at all. You know, that's fine. You know, that's all part and parcel. But um, when you're t- when you're doing stuff that's very much from a particular film that's so sort of ingrained, mm. uh, I think that's a mistake. But great, good, you know, the cast were really solid. You know, the the the, the film looked really good. Um, you know, this the you know it's clearly quite you know limited. But as as you know, like Rage was and stuff like that. Films, it's definitely in that sort of wheel. You know, sort of in that area. Of yeah. films that are made with very very modest budgets, but they really know how to to use them. This is made, this is the the only the only directing credit of um, of a director called Matt Minoni. Uh This was actually made, I think, in or at least originally twenty twenty one finished one twenty twenty one. So like, it's been sort of lying around a couple of years. I can't see any other work by this person, you know, short films or anything else or anything upcoming, but. That you know, they seem to come out of nowhere. They've done a good job. You know, I can't, I can't say they haven't. The the writer's got more of a, a background. Uh, jo, um, John, John Paul Chapel, who's um, well been around since the since the eighties, it seems, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but the yeah, I think the the thing is, it's su- it's such a well worn concept, and it's and you know everything's so kind of slight about it that there's really nothing more nothing much to say True. it's a solidly made slasher movie with some nice you know enjoyable supporting performances by you know recognizable actors like peter davison and that's pretty that's pretty much it <laughs> yeah i mean on, other than that sort of very contrived moment i, I talked about the rest of it mm. is 
relatively fine. Um, you know, we we don't have anything bad to say about it. It's 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 just that, you know, it it's in there. It's in the mix of all the other sort of slasher films. Um, it doesn't really have anything to sort of make it sort of stand out, which in itself isn't a bad thing. No, I was saying if you if you if you like a slasher movie, yeah, or you know, by all means, you won't be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. It's not it's not massively slashery. You know, it's not like there's not apart from that that scene you mentioned earlier, mm. um, and a couple of other bits. Uh, you know, there's a bit of gruesome in there, but it's it's more. Oh, there's a, there's a great decapitation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that you know that was um, that was very very interesting. Um, I'll tell you the film that came to mind probably more than any other when I was watching it, it was Valentine, okay, which was the Jamie Blanks um, yeah. uh, follow up to uh, Urban Legend. Yeah. So the, it, it kind of had a because the, the killer the, the killer in this one has a has a mask and it, it's not quite the same, but it's it's um, but it was not just it's not just the masked killer kind of thing. It's just sort of the atmosphere of it kind of made it just made. I might just be reading something into it, whatever, but I, that was the film, out of all the slasher movies, that was the one that sort of came to mind as feeling like it was um, uh, a touchstone for this. But let's say there's another movie that's not a slasher film, which is an even bigger touchstone, which is just like, oh, which I was just like, oh, come on, don't, no. <laughs> when it got to, when, you know, by the, by the end of the film. But, um, but still, I enjoyed it. It was, uh, you know, exceeded my expectations. A good solid British movie. Um, well, well, you know, if you if you enjoy it, if if you enjoy horror movies and that, you're not going to be disappointed. And on that I note, don't think anyway. I might be wrong, but I don't. Think so. On that note, Rich, how are you going to score it? I think it's a solid seven. Okay. Um, why not? I'll give it a seven as well. Two sevens for end of term. Go check it out. Our final main review is Washington Armour, also known as Washington's Armour. Uh, this follows the tra trajectory of George Washington as a boy and a young man as he develops his relationships and his ideals. Actually, skip the boy part. It, it's join, jump straight in as he's a young man. Um, he's an officer in the, um, in, in the army. Um, the film starts with him sort of helping out. Uh, an Indian tribe who's sort of like being converted from uh, working with the French and using very sort of brutal tactics, and he's he's a bit sort of put off by it all. Um, there's a war with France looming, and he is very key to try and um, you know ra raise troops for um, Ohio uh, in order to sort of um, de you know defend the state because. Otherwise, the French are coming, the French are coming. Um, it's pretty well done overall. This, um, you know, it, there is sufficient budget to make it go, oh, cool. You know, all, all of the um, all the period dress looks good. All the uniforms, all, you know, all, all of that um, seems authentic. There are some pretty decent, um, you know, there's a decent sized cast of extras for things like um, a ballroom scene, uh, you know, which is, which is all very well done. Um, he, he doesn't have a lot of men, admittedly. I think he's only got about 50 men um, at any one time. But I did enjoy this overall. You know, it wasn't too po-faced. It wasn't, um, you know, there was plenty of incident going on to sort of keep you interested. It sort of takes you up to a particular battle, um, it was a particular famous battle that, that he, he participated in, um, and, and sort of le leads from there. We, we get introduced to Martha, Martha, um, <laughs> at one stage as well, um, you know, and, and the sort of the way the film is written, the sort of dialogue um, is in keeping with the sort of style that people talk to, or at least the sort of the gentry talked at the time it's sort of um you know sometimes it is a bit difficult to follow <laughs> you're sort of looking at the subtitles and of course that you know the um internet generated subtitles are a joke um i don't, I don't know if you ever sort of had them on uh, but they they try to um they try to print phonetically 
you know, mm -hmm. sort of listen, listening to what people are saying and, and uh, oh, it's a mess sometimes. It's, it's quite amusing. But overall, I thought as a, you know, this wasn't too bad. Um, it's, it's still pre, um, you know, pre the war of independence, you know, that's, that's a way off basically. Um, mm -hmm. so, but even so, you know, we're talking about a guy who is, you know, his whole life was very well documented. Um, so, so there's, it's, it's plenty to sort of, um, you know, historical fact there. It's if if you're a history buff, you know, if you're a, a, a period history buff, I think you would enjoy this. It's uh, it's it's not low budget at all, really. I mean, certain scenes, you know, it is shot on sort of digital, I guess, rather than film. But I think it pulls it off for the most part. Considering that we were like, going, mm, "Shall we drop it?" You know, I was, yeah. was kind of glad we didn't in the end. Are you going to? Um, are you looking forward to volume two? <laughs> I, yeah, maybe because there is still a lot to cover. So I imagine volume two would be leading up to the War of Independence, at least. You know, um, and may, maybe sort of delve into that. I'd, I'd hope they get a bigger budget as well because they're going to need more people on screen. Yeah. Out of interest, does it? Um, was it presented? Uh, how widescreen was it? How did it look? Was yeah, it, it was, was it letterbox or was it um, well, sort of more no, full, no, no, filled it, the filled your sixty by nine was, screen? It was pretty letterbox, I think. Um, uh -huh. And does it? And because I, I get the feeling, or, or looking at the filmmakers and stuff, that that mm. it's it's made by a Christian filmmaking company. So I'm just wondering, is it? Is there any sort of religious that, elements no, that sort that, of pressed that, in? That, that film. didn't that didn't really come across. No, okay. That's all. Because um, the director previously did a short film about the crucifixion and all that sort of stuff. So I was, right. I was I was curious whether it was a because I've watched films like Mormon period hmm. films and some really yeah, like well, and uh, I was like would, if this was like a similar kind of standard, you know, where they've actually got really good solid production values rather than um, being yeah, a bit production too, sort of values cheap are really good. No, no, production values really reenactment good. teams yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah, everything from you know, as I said, the costumes, the you know, the the sets and everything all, all look very authentic. You know, I think they they must have had good access to sort of various country houses and things to mm -hmm. to, to pull mm -hmm. it off. But yeah, no, I, I thought it, they did it really well. I would give this one a six out of ten. Hmm. So go check it out. Our short shot this week is Lollipop. Rachel is given a week to reevaluate her life and determine if the path she's chosen will truly lead to a life she desires. However, her decision could have unforeseen circumstances. This is an interesting short, Rich. Mm. Um, although it does sort of spin its wheels for quite a while. So, you know, we get this incident at the beginning where uh, Rachel's sort of beaten up and she's given an ultimatum. You've got seven days. We're not sure what those, so, you know, we, we can assume what those, that ultimatum is, you know. But then she spends the next seven days just doing fuck all, you know, apart from sort of taking her medication and just doing nothing. <laughs> really except getting text messages going you've got six days you've got five days and it's like okay it's nicely edited you know um and i suppose the idea is is that you know she's taking this medication um which says don't you know don't drink alcohol but you're taking this medicine she's like ah fuck it i'm taking alcohol with my meds you you're not the boss of me um so we get these sort of interesting time jumps which are very nicely edited. It's almost as if, like, um, you know, Edgar Wright was was doing the editing on this uh, kind of thing. It's very very nice transitions uh, from day to day. Um, but then, you know, the film sort of wakes up, and we get this great sort of like um, almost a sort of comedic sort of Tarantino moment mm. or, or Guy Ritchie moment from Lockstock. You know, it's it's, it's kind kind of that. Um, with these sort of very inept drug dealers. I thought that was very good. Um, 
yeah and then and then the ending we you know we get this it's it's kind of that this bit of sweet moment where she, you know she's chosen to go down one path but then we sort of like see you know it's almost as if there's two doors she's got in one but we can sort of you know the, the, the second doors open a crack and we can sort of peek in and kind of see what might have been under door number two which is a sort of very interesting way of playing things um you cur curated this one as usual rich um what do you got to say for you uh, this came to my attention on uh, Film Combat Syndicate. Um, Mike Garcia wrote a, an article, a review of, on the film, we, uh, which I hadn't heard of. So uh, that, that's where I, I found the, the link to it. It's made by Raison Media Productions director uh, Jared Miller. Uh, it's about 20 minutes long. I think you're right. I think it's kind of, uh, it's quite, it's stylishly made uh, and it's quite, it's when are we going to get to the fireworks factory, as, mm. as you would say. Um, the but I think there's stuff you can sort of interpret about, you know, it's like it, it seems like, well, it's all about what you interpret in terms of how, what you think is actually happening. But the, um, so you get the original setup and then, yeah, the, there's this kind of, she's set up, the character is introduced as very sort of, devil may care is not quite the right, but she just, you know, she's very selfish and, you know, un, you know doesn't really care. You know, she's, she's you know. She's um, burned bridges, she, basically. Yeah, she's, yeah. Not, she's not a great, she's, She's not a good person, basically. They make that quite clear. Um, and she, and it's almost like, so my interpretation of what, what was happening was, you know, like uh, she's got to, you know, sort something out and, you know, um, you know, uh, and, you know, she's just watching the days go by because she's just, she just doesn't care. She's just like waiting for it to come. She's just like, uh, I'm not, I'm not even yeah. going to try. She's just like, oh, I'm not even going to bother. You know, it's just I, like, I yeah, think, you, yeah, you keep saying what's going to happen or whatever. I don't care. But then when it gets to, um, say, the latter part, when it really sort of gets into gear um, and you get a nice, you know, some action and stuff starts happening and, you know, uh, it, uh, um, and then we get to the conclusion of the film where the sort of rug gets pulled out from, from under you in, in quite, a, quite a clever way, I think. it's. Um, I think that's what sold it for me. It is mm -hmm. like... Um, Say stylish. The characterization is quite interesting. The, the the action's solid, and it's got a really, it's got a very cool twist of you know, it was right there from the start, but you just didn't see it. it kind of, it's yeah. quite clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think yeah, I mean, you, you, I think you're right in the, in that her attitude is like you know, I'm just gonna do what I do. But at the same time, I think you know, when, when she reaches out to her friend, I think it's sort of you know, I think. She's also battling with her own, you know, indecision mm -hmm. up to that point. So you know, she, she's not, she, she can't decide between between which which way to go. So she's, you know, she does reach out to a friend. Just, you know, well, that's sort of... the, you can't make her completely irredeemable. Mm. You know, that's the thing about you know having an, a sort of a not anti hero, but sort of a you know a a, curmudge a curmudgeonly character or whatever it is. You know, a, you know, sort of a moody character or. a bleak unappealing character you've got to put like an inkling there you've got to put something yeah. that says i've got to get on your side for something it's like you've got to see something in that character yeah. um not just all then the negative so you could so yeah there's you're hoping that you know you're seeing that she's got the potential that she could potentially make mm. a correct decision um but then actually she's probably going to do it um well, you'll see when you watch the film. <laughs> Indeed. <clears throat> okay, so we don't score the shorts, but we do recommend you go check them out. And you will find a link to this in the footnotes below. Go check it out. Our DTV throwback this week is Ballistic. Badass cop Jessie Gavin finds herself battling her misogynist team members as much as the scum on the streets. Um, <laughs> can we get more 80s than this, Rich? Or, or mid-90s. Or mid-90s, even. Yeah. Can we get more VHS-era um, straight-to-video <laughs> thriller than this? Um, I, I it's got really, it all, really I think. It's got it every is... single um, yeah. you know, convention of the period, I think. I think it has. Um, great cast as well. So, Amazing some great, cast. Yeah, some great familiar faces in this one. Um, I like the start, you know, we, we, again, you know, like the film we talked about last week, it sort of throws in a kind of a bit of TNA right at the beginning. 
and then it's like hey baby i gotta go to work and then you know she goes out as a street walker it's like okay um very interesting opening um we've got the likes of sam jones in this i thought he was great you know um nice to have him without his voice being dubbed uh the whole the first half of this is just so misogynistic it really is you know if it wasn't for the fact that we're taking everything from her point of view uh th th this would be you know a bit of a red flag <laughs> film it really would there's a great bit where sam jones is screwing his secretary and she says oh you know, sure thing we're going to go uh, we're not fucking anymore so it's back to mister <laughs> <So, laughs> sort of things like that um andrew tate would be proud he would be proud he really would the whole bit you know where, where she goes on this bus it turns out you know she's an undercover cop and um her backup is nowhere to be seen and then afterwards they're bitching about her saying oh she didn't even check her microphone to see if it was working and all that you know um but it's like as soon as she starts talking to him the the condescending attitude is like hey sweet cheeks hey honey you know all this sort of shit it's like oh god i mean how how she's not punching them in the face and kicking them in the balls um is is beyond me um <clears throat> it's it is very amusing uh and of course um We've got a certain Michael J. White in this. Now, did you know he was in it? I didn't know he was in it. Before. Did you go, hang on a minute, that's Michael J. White? Well, the funny thing, what happened was, I was watching it, and I'm thinking, this guy is, is basically got his own movie within a movie. Because so much time is, is spent on Michael J. White's character during these fights. You know, it, it's almost like he's in a you know, a blood sport tournament slash Lionheart kind of scenario. Um, and I, and it, it took me a while to realize, hang on a minute, you know, that is it's Michael J. White. And, you know, he's credited as just Michael White, um, but, but it's, it's definitely him. So I was really impressed that he was getting, you know, so much screen time for, you know, kickboxer number one kind of, kind of thing. I, I thought he, he was really good. I mean, the, the fight scenes are... You know, if, if you compare the fight scenes with, between that, this and Fist of the Condor, um, that there, there is quite a difference. But at the same time, they're pretty acrobatic. You know, there's some really good sort of spin kicks and jumping kicks, things going on like, on in this. Some good well, a bit throws. like Michael's, Marco Zorro, you know, like we were saying, yeah. like he went, when he hit, hit that guy and he flew across the room. Michael Jai White does one of his really sort of powerful signature kicks and just kicks, a, kicks a guy yeah. across the room. There's, there's a lot of um, cardboard boxes to be... Cardboard box. It's a very cardboard box movie, yeah. Yeah, it's a very cardboard box movie. Um, but but I did enjoy this. Yeah, as I said, you know, um, our, our heroine is having to battle people's attitudes. You know, the, 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 the cop she's with who, um, you know, is supposed to be looking after this witness and she comes out of the bathroom and he's, he's fucked off and she's like, oh, right, okay, someone's going down. And then he just strolls back in later on as if nothing had happened. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you sent me away. That was, um, yeah, it's just weird. The, the audacity of some of it is great. It really is. Um, Richard Roundtree is in this, of course. Yep. Uh, very good. Um, yeah, it, overall, it's, it's, it's just a, a very solid... You know, lots of action, lots of lots of good stuff going on. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. The, um, the, the we we get a great moment of Chekhov's gun, or Chekhov's um, rocket launcher in this yeah. case. <laughs> you know, you another can't very show... prevalent uh, trope of the uh, of the period. <laughs> you can't show us a rocket launcher and not use it. You know, it's just not done, and and this doesn't disappoint. So yeah, I I was totally on board with this one. I hadn't heard of it before. I hadn't seen it before. Um, but I, I thought it worked. Yeah, I've been wanting to see it for years. Uh, it's, it's an, it's, I don't know if it ever had a proper UK release. Um, but uh, so, so th this version we found is on YouTube. One of the um, uh, one of there's a there's a number of uh, people on YouTube who uh, it's pir you know piracy as archive. Yeah. Uh, you know, preservation, piracy of preservation. Yeah. So, you know, all this, these films that you just taken can't from find the anymore. Disc as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a laser disc. Yeah. Which is why I think there's that 
bit in the middle or about in the middle where mm. the film just like just goes like black for like yeah. a few minutes or not a few minutes but you know like I don't know a minute or something it, it's it's like I think they were changing discs or something and that must be what happened um but yeah so it's it's pretty good the so having I've I'm coming at it with uh, I'd uh, I'd wanted to see it for a really long time was it going to live up to my expectation it's say it's very much of the time so we've got a uh a female hero uh, played by Marjean Holden. Uh, and she doesn't get to carry the film as much as you would hope mm. she would. Um, okay. Kind of a pro kind of a, an issue with the, um, you know, female led action of the time anyway. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff would still defer to, to the males stars, you know, that there, there are a few that like, you know, Cynthia Rothrock made a few where she was very much the focus, but then there were others where they sort of, leveraged her and sort of went off and followed the other followed some other characters and that's what happens here is they they surround her with all these other characters and then mm. they go and like say oh no honey you go, you go off and do that uh we, we, we we're gonna do do that especially in the second half where richard roundtree sort of basically yeah. becomes the main act main star mm. and she she's off you know investigating and then it's her and i'm sorry it's richard roundtree and her boyfriend and we're essentially following them for the most of the time. And then it sort of, they go and find her at the end. And then she gets to have the sort of final, uh, have one of the climactic fight scenes and stuff. Mm. So she's good in what she gets to do. But then she say the film sort of keeps pulling away to go and do other things. It, it also says, well, you've got to get, you've got to be in the shower first time we see you. <laughs> and uh, you've got to have a love scene uh, yeah. and, and all this sort of stuff. So she, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's made, you don't see that in quite the same way today but we watched kill shot a couple of weeks ago which shows that although you don't get maybe the same level of nudity and stuff hmm. some things are still not quite changed uh you know and um oh yeah so hmm. you know not that that's always a bad thing i mean you know it's it's, it's you know you know guys want to see girls and and, 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 and you know whatever and but, sometimes yeah. well, girls want to see boys or whatever it is and um so but it is very, uh, you know, shoehorned in, sort of a bit sleazy kind of, kind of stuff. But it, that's that's kind of what they did during this period, oh, especially as this yeah. is the period of erotic thrillers and stuff. So they're yeah. they're channeling that as well. Which I is think of things what... like, you know, fair. It was a fair game, the one with Cindy Crawford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would have been yeah. around the same time as this. Exactly. Yeah. There's um, there's a funny moment in this. Uh, we got Charles Napier playing um, the, the you know the police the captain. captain. I think he's played uh, the captain in loads of films. Yeah, I love Charles Napier. He is great, yeah. Um, and there's a scene at the end where he suddenly just shoots somebody. You know, there's a guy sort of going, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm not dealing with this anymore. You know, I'm saving myself. Yeah, yeah. And he walks <laughs> off and he gets shot in the back. And I thought, it would be amazing if it turns out that he's not dirty. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if he was... Yeah, because I was just like, hang on a minute. <laughs> And he just, he, it, the line he says is like, I hate, you know, basically, uh, without yeah, giving it, all, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah there's only one cover. thing that it, worse than a dirty, a dirty carp is a, is a coward, yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? You, you, aren't you what? a dirty carp? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but if he's not, so I was thinking, well, the fact that he said that, maybe he's not a dirty cop. Maybe and that's he's not just, a dirty cop. It just kills just, just straight up murdered someone. Back. <laughs> you know, but just... I kind of thought that about Marjean Holden's cat. I mean, I know heroes normally do kill mm. people in there, but she basically like snaps necks no, where oh, yeah, she didn't yeah. really need to. It's just like, yeah. um, anyway. So yeah, this um, it's it's a, like procedural detective trying to take down the drug dealer kind of stuff. But then it's got all this uh, punch fighter pad padding. Mm -hmm. where they've got where um uh, uh sam jones is running these illegal fights mm -hmm. so that's a, sort of like shoehorns in some extra actions scenes and stuff and that's where michael jai white's um character who's actually got a name he's he's a uh, quint, yeah, quint yeah. Uh, who's it, got it more good more screen good time than i thought he was gonna have and he has he has a fight with uh, Niels allen stewart yeah. which is pretty cool i love those uh, you know i love both those guys so that's cool to see um see them at. and the funny thing is you they have the fight and you think Niels Allen Stewart's won yeah. because it looks like he's broken Michael Jai White's back. And then Michael Jai White gets up and they fight for another few minutes. Yeah. Well, There's a, <laughs> then... a little nod and a wink, isn't there, with, between him and um, uh, Sam Jones' character. Uh -huh. it's like, it's like, just... Yeah, he's, like, he's, like, he's almost like, he's not quite henchman, number one, but he's, but he's, he's close because he does get a couple of other scenes you know they i don't know whether they watched them so actually we, we're going to put you we're going to have put you in this next scene where you're going to do like this flip 
uh, and then you're going to sort of square off to sort of face down with this other, you know, the, the boyfriend character and stuff, which is where the film goes off in those other directions and that. But they, I, like, I did this... like that bit, you know, where, where yeah. he gets caught. Is it when he gets caught snooping, they go, oh, you're here for an audition, right? Okay. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, oh, fucking hell, right, okay. <laughs> so then, shoehorn in another fight scene. Another fight scene. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so that, so we got then we've also got Vince Klin, um, who was who was a guy who, or Vince or Vincent Klin, who was in uh, Cyborg and, and loads of other stuff. Mm-hmm. Very rec- very recognised. I think he was in Point Break as well. Um, he's he's in here as again one of the, sort of, you could almost call him hench, henchman number one because he's what no um, he's linked. He doesn't get to do really much of the fight scenes as mu- as much as Michael mm-hmm. Joel White, but he is linked. He is around sort of threateningly quite a lot. We've got James Liu. Yeah. As uh, the cop um, who's uh, disparaging um, uh, yeah, Jesse what, what Holden's yeah. character, and he was he's actually good because um, hmm. you know James Liu uh, quite often cast in sort of small roles or as like baddies and not much dialogue and stuff. And here he's actually you know uh, um, not a complex character, but not the char- you know more of a character than i usually yeah. we usually get to see him play he's got some you know dialogue and you know he's you know he's not you're not quite um you know he gets to be a character you know he's a he's a, he's a, he's a bit of a scumbag and stuff and so um the uh and he's the choreographer of the the action he's the sun, he's the sun coordinator and fight coordinator on the film so he brings a lot to it i think and also you've got um so we've already mentioned uh, Richard Roundtree. There's a few other people in in the cast, like Ro- Robert Miano turns up and stuff. But the um, the other thing I want to mention, apart from the cast that's notable and the choreographer, is that the uh, the composer of the film is Tyler Bates, yes, who's uh, who's gone on to you know John Wick and all that sort of stuff. He's like one of the go to guys in in Hollywood now for from composing films. And uh, yeah, he's, I didn't realize his career went back this far. Um, so that was really interesting to see his name turn up on the credits. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure where this actually. I'm going to have a quick look where this sits. He's he'd only been composing for a couple of years, or, or at least on films. Uh, he's got two other credits before this, which is also known as Fist of Justice. By the way, if you ever try to look it up on IMDb, it's under Fist of Justice with the poster for Ballistic. Um, but yeah, he was in he was in DTV land until Get Carter. Basically, which was still essentially DTV, but that was the Stallone movie that he yeah. that he did quite a good score, or you know, reworking of the old reworked the classic mm-hmm. um, scores, I think, and uh, brought some of his own stuff to it. But then went on to, you know, he bid he bid Half Past Dead, the Steven Seagal movie, and uh, I think it's kind of film, films like The Devil's Rejects, where yeah. he sort of you know sort of crossed over into getting bigger work, and then you know Three Hundred and stuff. So. Uh, doomsday all sorts of stuff you know he's, he's he's in he's in much demand these days so that's really cool to go back and sort of um discover that it's not i wouldn't say this is a a, a, a particularly good movie or a great movie or anything but i will say it's got lots of compo- composite you know it's got lot, lots of elements that we enjoy you know the casting's great it's got the um you know the obligatory rocket launcher. There's no sort of um, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a car chase, but it's not an amazing one. It's not quite PM, but it's basically got a lot of the say, if, if, yeah. elements of a PM entertainment film. Yeah. Even Sam Jones, who was in a P, he was in PM stuff himself, makes you feel was this made by PM? Well, no, it wasn't, but it but it does definitely there's have only that one explosion. There's only one explosion. There's only one explosion. Of course, of course, it wasn't PM. Um, but yeah, I think that's what would have made it a great movie. Is is if um, you know, if if this had been under the PM Entertainment banner, that'd been great. Um, but as it is, it, it's solid enough. Um, you know, it has these sort of interesting elements as the whole sort of um, you know the uh, misogynist attitude and everything. It's um, yeah, you know, villains that you you just love to hate, basically. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a lot going on. <laughs> The real henchman of the movie is actually a henchwoman. It's uh, Claudia yeah. played yeah, by Karina she's, Everson. She's very good as well. So yeah. she's the one who gets to have sort of um, the big showdown with. Yeah, she has a couple of good little scenes. She, she's, yeah, she's she does, like yeah. the, She's like the white version of um, Joyce Gadenzi, um, uh, Sammer Hung's wife, because she, she, I think that's the one I'm thinking of. She, oh, she's what a from bodybuilder. She shoots straight. Yeah. 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 Um, so she, you know, she's got that going for her, sort of, you know, mm-hmm, sort mm-hmm. of deadlifting the bad guys over her head and stuff. 
all good stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, there's this one bit actually where she throws this guy hmm. in the in one of the earlier scenes. It's a really yeah. good stunt bit yeah, where she, so. I think, she chucks him over. A, um, it's like a sofa or something. It's like a, I thought that was a really good bit of stunt work there between them both. And uh, yeah. yeah, and I think the fights are well choreographed. And say as as unnecessary as a lot of it is. I enjoyed it, and I, you know, Richard Roundtree, you know, he can make, you know, he can, you know, spin out a, you know, he brings this shot, his, you know, his charm, you know, that he's, you know, from, you know, that, you know, is what made his, him famous in films like Shaft and stuff. That's all there, you know. He's, he's he brings a he brings a lot to it playing this. He's played that character or variations of that character yeah. in loads of different stuff, uh, and I. I you know, it's it's a bit. It might maybe it's a bit one note, but it just it works for me. I, I thought he was really good. Same as Charles Napier, he's always the same essentially. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's very little variation. Uh, Sam Jones is uh, sometimes he's a hero, sometimes he's a villain. He's one of those guys who can sort of move between the two. But I thought he, he does play a really good villain. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, the, you know, the the sort of the star card, you know, the sort of the, the main reason to to see it is, you know, that appearance by Michael J. White because you know. I think they knew what they had with him. Oh yeah, and that's what I think I, they I probably think it, brought I him in it's... for like one scene, and maybe yeah, said, and they "Actually, thought, oh, we've got to we've got to do more <laughs> with this guy." <laughs> yeah, let's keep him around. Yeah, exactly. Because he was sort of spinning. He was doing, I think, like a lot of films of this type. He'd started out. He he worked in, you know, DTV movies and low budget movies for quite a long time mm. before like breaking out in Spawn and mm. and stuff like that. Which was, you know, Spawn was only like what two years after this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. so. Cool. Well, we don't score the throwbacks, but we do recommend you go check them out. This is a lot of fun. Uh, we'll put a link to the um, the version we found on YouTube in the footnotes below. Go check it out. And that is the end of this week's show. Uh, as you had noticed, uh, Steve isn't with us this week. He's off on his holes. So thanks to Rich for watching these films with us, uh, with me even. Um, Fist of the Condor is my is my film of the week. I have to say it's it's most likely going to be in my top ten at the end of the year. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but yeah, uh, No One Will Save You was pretty decent. Um, I, I disagree with the other two a little bit. Yeah, I think the haunting or haunting of the Queen Mary was possibly my favourite of the week. And that was a controversial controversial choice. Yeah, so. yeah, I, would, I didn't see that coming. Uh, thank you for listening um, don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter at the DTV Digest also check out the short shots where we put a link to a new short every evening around about 8 o'clock other than that, thanks for listening tune in next time thank you for listening to the DTV Digest let us know your thoughts in the comments and tune in again next time